All right, here we are again, and now we're going to look at Lecture 8. And in today's lecture, we're going to start talking about the argument, right? How to make an argument, formulate an argument. There's a couple of ways to do that. Uh, so I hope you have your notes in front of you because I'm going to be adding things as we go along, all right? Um, like, like, obviously, you have the information you need, but I will be making some, 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 just some clarifications, all right? So, there's two words that we're looking at here today, argument and persuasion. Now, in a sense, they both mean kind of the same thing, but there is a subtle difference, all right? There's a very subtle difference, and I'll show you the difference as we go along. And so, they're used in a variety of writing formats, and um, as the term implies, right, uh, the idea, especially for your final term paper, is to convince, right? And that's why I have that bolded, con to convince the reader of your position. So that's why, so far, I've, I've been trying to stress the idea that you don't just kind of make observations, random points, or what have you. You have to make a case. And I'm pretty sure that's coming up in, uh, oh, I don't know. <laughs> well, it'll be in the lecture somewhere, I guarantee you. And so it's... Um, the terms, as I said, are often used interchangeably, all right? You'll see what I mean. And that's why they're usually taught together, okay? But, but like I said, there is a subtle difference, all right? And so, um, in, in fact, really effective readers, not necessarily in first-year courses, but in, like, like in upper-level courses or in graduate school, can actually use the two together, as you'll see, all right? And so, one point that I want to make clear at the, at the, at, at the very beginning today, all right? Um, sometimes the thesis in certain, certain persuasive pieces is not stated until the near the end uh, and is commonly used um, for, for, let me say that again. Sometimes you'll find that the thesis in certain persuasive pieces, okay, notice I didn't say argument there, in certain persuasive pieces will be found at the end of uh, the the. Well, the, the piece of writing, I'll just leave it at that just for a moment. That would be found in things like speeches or editorials, all right? Uh, where the audience may not agree with your point of view at the very beginning. But when it comes to an argument, it's very different, all right? So that's why I say there, you do not want to do that for your final paper. So let's think about it instead. Remember back to lecture four, okay? If you remember back to lecture four, I said that the thesis should be in the last sentence of your introduction, okay? So that almost sounds like a contradiction if I confused you there. There, there are times where, in, in, like, people who, who do this for a living, they know sometimes not to put the thesis at the very beginning because you might want to kind of get the, the audience on your side with other information. That's not how an argumentative piece works in an academic paper. So, make, why don't I just make this nice and clear. Make sure for your final term paper, your thesis is and the last sentence of your introduction. Simple as that. And I'll elaborate on that as we go along. Okay? And so, there it is. Remember, as I said, I'm just going to read the notes now. Remember what we discussed in Lecture 4. Okay? And so, don't, I don't know if I need to say anything more than that. Okay. Now, I'll start then with persuasion then will blend with argument. So persuasion usually appeals to one or more of the following. So as I get through these three aspects, then you'll see exactly what, what, where I'm going, all right? So we could appeal to reason, number one, where the writer relies on logic and intellect, okay? And that's effective when you're expecting your readers to disagree with you in any way. Now, remember back again to lecture four, okay? Three or four, I can't remember. Whenever we talked about the thesis, an intelligent person should be able to disagree with your point of view. There's nothing wrong with that. In other words, if, if, if an intelligent person can't disagree, then why bother writing the paper, okay? And I, I'm, I'm repeating myself from an earlier lecture, all right? So, we could talk about reason. Then, we could appeal to emotion. And emotional appeals, however, attempt to arouse the reader's feelings, senses, biases, right? Th th those types of things. And then finally, ethics. So let's just say you're taking a philosophy course. Well, or, or, or uh, maybe you're interested in environmentalism. 
Well, then maybe notions of ethics would come into to, to your papers as well. And that's usually, like it says, associated with philosophical ideas. Although ethics has very profound meanings for different individuals. Um, not too many people really understand what, what that term means. It, ethics, in, in the simplistic form, means for the common good. All right. It doesn't mean right or wrong necessarily. Right. Um, but anyway, okay. So now let's look at those three pieces here. I'm going off the notes now. Let's think about those three three um, aspects of writing. Okay, for an argument. Do you want to appeal to emotion? Well, if you do, you have to be really careful, really careful. Because when we appeal to emotion, quite often, your attitudes and prejudices and biases will come into the writing process. And quite often, you will end up offending your reader. Why? Because you're ta you take too much for granted. Ethics, same thing. So, if we were in the classroom right now, and I, I were to say, okay, which of these, these three do you think will apply for your final term paper? It's obviously number one. So make sure that you, 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 when you're writing your final term paper, make sure you appeal to reason, relying on intellect. Okay, let's go back to the, the words there, intellect and logic. So when I'm reading your final term paper, I'm looking for, are you making a logical argument? Do you have a foundation, which I'll get into, I think, on page two. So watch out for that. So I guess what I'm really saying is avoid topics in which all of a sudden you're drawn to emotion or ethics. Okay, watch out for topics like that, right? Please, <laughs> I've done this so many times, right? Like, like, like papers that start to appeal to emotion, they're usually not very effective. So put a big star beside reason. That's what we want. Simple as that, okay? When I say we, I mean I. <laughs> That's what I want. <laughs> okay. Now, I still haven't distinguished between argument and persuasion. When we deal with persuasion, you could think about, um, I don't know, uh, the editorial section of any newspaper. Oh, maybe I should pause here. I should explain what a newspaper is. <laughs> Back in the days of yore, do you remember yore? <laughs> We had these things called newspapers. Okay, they, they still exist online. As a matter of fact, most of uh, social media and online writing is, is editorial, right? No, no real basis or whatever. People just spewing out their opinions, okay? And so it is true that, that, that editorials are still out there. Um, but, but again, you don't want to be doing that type of writing for this course, okay? All right. So, like I said, sometimes persuasion does not utilize documentation. Okay, but, but, but documentation will be essential for your final term paper. Okay, so sources, that's why I have that bolded. And so also, the grade for the final paper will be, um, will be based on whether or not you are convincing and not just on structure and paragraphing. Now, don't worry, don't, don't, don't get all upset. That's not to say that I have to agree with your opinion. But you do have to make a convincing case backed up by secondary material. All right. Okay. And on the course outline, it says two academic peer reviewed journals. All right. And again, we'll talk about this during the workshops. Uh, but, uh, but I want to stress that. I'm not saying I have to agree with your position. I'm simply saying you have to make a good logical case for whatever you're arguing. That's all. Okay. And so, and so that's why I'm weaning you off of. Um, Oh, web websites that really don't have much credibility. Like we want to avoid stuff like that, right? For the final term paper. Okay. All right. So now let's get into the subtle difference between argument and persuasion. All right. Okay. So in the context of writing, argument and persuasion, they refer to a type of writing that has a, that, 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 that have a, a, a particular uh, purpose. That might be gram grammatically incorrect the way I wrote that. Yeah, anyway, um, and so um, basically either one attempts to, uh, to lead the reader to share the writer's belief, right? So remember, remember something I said, I don't know if I said this early on in the course, I, I'm pretty sure I did. 
where all argumentation, all argumentation is subjective. It is because it's your opinion, but the art is to make it sound objective. That's when I was talking about the first person pronoun, getting rid of stuff like that in your writing, only because it leads to ineffective writing or, or at least less effective writing, maybe is a better way of saying it, okay? And so here's the subtle difference then between argument and persuasion, all right? Argument is the term applied to the logical approach to writing, okay? Convincing a person by way of the mind. Persuasion, on the other hand, is applied to the emotional approach, convincing a person by way of the heart. Okay, now these are these are standard definitions. They're not great, but they're standard definitions that I took straight out of. Can't even remember which text I took it from. Um, but but you, I think you see the difference there. So if I were to ask in class, okay, so which one do you think we're interested in? Obviously, it's argument, not persuasion. And so now I'll start to get into argument and what that really means. Okay, what that really means. <laughs> okay. And, and, and sometimes, sometimes writers can use both, especially when um, I'm thinking now about maybe journalism. And in journalistic writing, you can actually apply the two. But, but I'm not really looking for that here in, 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 uh, for your final paper in this course. Okay? All right. Yeah. Now, an important part of convincing the reader, these notes sound so obvious, I know, but... You want to get the facts straight. Okay. How do I know if, if my, my facts are credible? Peer-reviewed journals. Right? I mean, like we, we've talked about that in, in the workshops. Um, I, it's on the course outline. As long as you have, go to a peer-reviewed source, then yes, you're fine. And almost every library, university library database, right? Almost, not all, but almost all of those sources should be fine. There are, there are, there are exceptions. I think, I think I'll hold off on talking about that in the lecture. Maybe we can discuss that in workshop as any, if anyone is interested. Okay. But, okay. So my, my point being, your argument is only as strong as the logic behind it. So let's just say you make a, um, um, let, let's say you make an incorrect assumption in your introduction and, like, and, and I'll, I will spot that right away and I'll know then this paper is not going anywhere. But the good news is because you have already or will have, sorry, uh, I want to make, I want to get my dates straight here uh, because by the time you write your final paper, you'll already have been given feedback on your introduction. That shouldn't be a problem. Okay. Right. Right, like, uh, like I'll give you feedback saying this is problematic. Like you, you may want to change that entire argument or thesis, right? And we'll have lots of time for that. And remember, I'll be doing that with your outline as well. Okay, so lots of feedback before we find we get to the final process. Okay, so to convince, um, the reasoning must be sound. Okay, if it's not, and now these these are really important words. I know they might sound a bit obvious, but if if the reasoning isn't sound. The reader could become confused, like obviously, right? Obviously, <laughs> um, insulted or, uh, sorry, or insulted rather than convinced. Uh, what do I really mean by that? If you start bringing your own opinions into thing without backing them up at all, that's where a reader just gets, starts to get turned off thinking, mm, okay, I'm, I'm not convinced of any of this stuff, okay? And, and so we're going to go into that right now and show you how do we avoid stuff like that. Okay, so... There are two fundamental ways of arguing, okay, of making an argument. And if you've taken a philosophy course, my goodness, you, you've heard this a thousand times. I'm sure most of you know these things. So I usually, I was like 20 years ago, I, I used to take a lot of time on this next portion. I won't today, okay? I, I, I think you'll understand if I just start making like, like, like clarifications after we do what is known as induction and deduction. I know, you probably learned this in high school. I know, okay. So inductive reasoning, um, it's, and these are, these are actual definitions here, so they sound a bit, a bit convoluted, but I'll, I'll elaborate. So in, in inductive reasoning, that is the logical process of examining a number of individual cases and coming to a general conclusion. 
So let's slow down here just for a second. That definition does sound, as I said, a bit convoluted, but if you think about the scientific method, perfect example, that would be inductive reasoning, where you observe, you observe, and then by that observation, you come to a conclusion. You don't have your mind made up first, okay? Although there's a great deal of bad science out there, that goes back to um, credible sources, a lot of bad science out there that already has its mind made up, people who are paid to well, like, basically become spokespeople for certain companies or what have you, and they're basically lying to you. <laughs> I don't know how any other way to put it, but, but they, they back it up with what they call science, all right? But um, anyway, okay, I shouldn't have said that, but I don't care. Um, all right, so here's an example of inductive reasoning. I, I need a number of cases, then I come to a conclusion. Scientific method, if used properly, right? Okay, so here's my example. I ordered a number of pizzas from Fido's, and they were all horrible, and concluded that their pizza was crap. Now, that's on me, because I should have figured that out after the first pizza, right? But anyway, but, but, but that's how that kind of logic works. Like, you have to actually watch, you have to observe, see what the, the material says, and then come to your conclusion. Now, this is where it gets a bit complicated, because deductive reasoning, on the other hand, it sounds like it's very different, but for our purposes, there it may be a blend of both. You'll see what I mean. You'll see what I mean. So deductive reasoning, on the other hand, instead of considering specific cases to come up with a general statement, okay, your thesis, right, uh, or, or sorry, your conclusion, deduction applies to a general statement to a specific instance and then reasons through to the logical conclusion. So, okay, okay. Sounds confusing, but let's simplify. Then I'll go into the example uh, that we have in front of us. So, in a way, if you follow the 15-step uh, model that I gave you, on the one hand, you're kind of using inductive reasoning to begin with because you're, you're, you go look at the material, you find out information, you do a bit of research. So, so in other words, you're, only, you're trying to search for the, the thesis that will eventually emerge out of all of your research. But then you kind of flip it a bit because now you can then move from kind of inductive research into a deductive principle where now, yes, I can actually come up with my thesis statement, which if you look at the definition is the general, uh, sorry, the general statement that, that is in the definition and apply that, okay, to a specific instance or the material, the research material, and then reason through to a logical conclusion. So, so it, it maybe I'm being a bit too semantic there with, with my language, right? All, all I'm getting at is it, it, when it comes to the thesis statement, on the one hand, you don't want to make up your mind at the very beginning. So, in a sense, that's that's kind of inductive. But by the time you finish your research, then you want to make that strong statement at the beginning in the introduction, your thesis, right? And that, in a sense, is deductive. Okay, so, so again, maybe I'm complicating, oh, oh, like, maybe I'm overcomplicating things for no reason. But I, that, I think you see what I'm getting at there. And so, deduction then is the formal, it, 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 it's a formal logic of something called a syllogism. And this goes back to the Greeks. So this goes way back. And it's the traditional three-part formula. And again, if you've taken a philosophy course, you've seen this before. Major premise, all humans are mortal. So in a sense, that could almost be like your thesis, right? It, like That's your statement. Minor premise, Socrates is human. Now we're getting into the body evidence of how we're going to prove that first, that first statement. Conclusion, Socrates is mortal. So that, that's kind of the logic. That's the way you put something like that together, okay? Yeah, uh, 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 it, this would work better. If we were in class, we could, we could talk about this and throw ideas back and forth, right? So, so maybe, maybe I am making this more complicated than it needs to be. Um, but keep in mind, all right, let, let, let's close that chapter of the book, okay? Uh, keep in mind. Deduction is only as solid as is as it sorry as its premise, and your premise eventually, after you do the research, after you've done all the work, will become your thesis, right? So 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 
even, even though the form that I'm giving you looks like it's straightforward, when it comes to the writing process and making an argument, it's also kind of backwards, right? We do the research first, we do the work first, then we come up with the thesis. All right? Maybe that's all I needed to say. Maybe I just wasted 20 minutes of, of your time. <laughs> okay, anyway. Now, here's what I'm looking for when it comes to your final paper, all right? And I'm going to read this out. Notice where I bolded. If readers are able to, de to detect logical gaps, faulty premises, or unsupportable generalizations, that's a, that's a huge one, an unsupportable generalization, then the reader will not be convinced of anything you have to say. It, it, it's as simple as that. If you start throwing ideas out and you don't have any support, or if you're saying things that basically are based on false premises, okay? For instance, where would you get information based on false premises? From the web, right? From, from you know, Sandra's website, right? And Sandra happens to be a right-wing uh, conspiracy theorist or whatever. Well, then you want to be careful of stuff like that. I could have said left wing as well. No, no, no sense in dividing the the room, right? It could have been left wing conspiracy as well. Uh, well, what I'm saying is, that's why we have to go back to peer review that we can trust. All right. So in um, in the final paper, that's where questions such as, "Can I use government pamphlets when it comes to my my argument?" Well, all right. Um, if you're in, say, again, if you're in political science, you probably will have to use things like that down the road. But I would talk to your instructor or professor about that because I would argue that government pamphlets, government pamphlets, are also biased. They they, they put forth a platform based on whatever government is is, is in power at the moment. So. You want to avoid stuff like that, all right? Un un until, like I said, until you start to get more sophisticated, you talk to your instructor, your professor, what have you, um, just to see what they think, all right? But but there, but again, peer-reviewed journal, you're okay. Like, like it, it, r rather than giving you all the examples of what you shouldn't be using, all I need to say is peer-reviewed journal, you're fine. <laughs> and I will get, I, I know, I will get email. Can I use this? Can I use that? Well, what did I say in lecture eight? <laughs> Peer-reviewed journal. Then you're fine. <laughs> All right. Anyway. All right. So, in short then, which uh, is not happening in this lecture because I'm rambling, um, any writing to convince must be grounded in sound logic. Simple as that. So, like I said, if you start, I, I could give you, I could give you many examples. As a matter of fact, I'm going to get into a couple of things in just a moment. All right. So, so watch out for that. All right. And again, we will, we we will have talked about that in in workshops anyway. Okay. So sometimes I refer to it as group or whatever. Like in our meetings, our Zoom meetings, we we'll talk about that. What topics work, what don't. Um, um, ah, that's enough. Anyway, okay. So again, though, I want to repeat that. So faulty premises or generalizations, watch out for those things when it comes to your essays, okay, for your final term paper. So now we get into the purpose. Why do we write arguments? Well, because I told you you have to to get a passing grade in this course. No, okay. <laughs> but why do you write arguments to begin with? You write an argument to make a case. Lecture four. I'm pretty sure it's lecture four. Let me just give me a second here. I just want to double check just because just I, I don't want you to have to go running around to figure it out. Um, yeah, lecture four, where we're talking about the thesis statement. OK, and remember, I think it's number one. You must make a case. You don't just make observations. So think about it this way. You're writing a paper and you think you want to write about something that happened in history. So first this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. And I'm reading it thinking, yeah, okay, but we all know that. Uh, what's the point of the paper? That's not an argument. That's not an argument when you just put stuff together saying A, B, C, D, E, like just making points, right? Instead, you have to start with a case. Once you start with your case, then we can move on to develop a really good argument that becomes convincing. So... I would strongly, strongly recommend at this point, don't use the topics that I have on the course outline. All right, they're, they're, 
they're, they're okay. Like some people want guidance. Some students just want guidance. So therefore I thought, okay, I'll, I'll put some topics on, but really those are not the best topics. Instead, come up with something on your own. I strongly, strongly recommend that. Okay. I can't, I can't, I can't say that strongly enough, but anyway, all right. So, but yeah, come up with, come up with something on your own. All right. Um, something, so, something maybe, so, an, an area that maybe you already have a bit of familiarity with, right? With which you already have familiarity. <laughs> that's the way you would say that. <laughs> I sound like Sheldon Cooper off of uh, the Big Bang Theory. Yes, that's the way you say that. Anyway, all right. So you make a case, okay? You're going to make a case. My head almost went through the uh, computer screen there, right? I almost came jumping out at you. But anyway, all right. So, um, and, and so, yeah, you want to make a critical analysis. And critical... Okay, can mean judgment for or against, but you have to have proof. You have to back it up, right? Like critical doesn't always mean negative, right? To be critical, if you think about it, could also mean objective. But remember, objective, but still kind of subjective, except you're making it sound objective. I hope that I, I hope I'm being clear with that. I, I'm, I'll bet a couple of you are confused. Like, well, is it one thing or is it the other thing? It's kind of both. Except that we, except the way that we use those terms, right, have very, on the one hand, have rigid meanings, but they kind of blend in together. So I'm being sub, like all opinion is subjective, but I make it sound objective. So that's where it comes down to tone, right? The way in which you present material. That's why I, I fought with a couple of you <laughs> when it came to the first person pronoun. Look, if you want to use the word I, go ahead. I can't stop you. But if you want if, if you want some advice for someone who's done this for 150 years, don't use the first person pronoun. All right? But anyway. Okay. <laughs> no, I haven't done this for 150 years. Pretty damn close, though. All right. Anyway. Okay. So, so basically what I'm trying to show you here today is you're going to figure all this stuff out as you move through your academic career. Um, learning the logical processes that underline argument and persuasion. Um, basically, it has another purpose as well that extends way beyond the act of writing. Think about, well, okay, just let me read this out here, but, but then I, I know exactly where I'm going with this. There's, there is a hidden agenda when it comes to most information that is given to you throughout your lives. Yeah, of course. There are, exam there, there are times where that's not true. Like when you're simply given, you know, the volleyball game will be moved from 2.30 to, to 3.30. Okay, fine, right? That's just simply informative information. There, um, I could get into the whole idea about the, the, different, uh, um, the, the different audiences that we can write for, but that's not really, that's not really what we need to do today. Um, but so, so there's informative writing where you simply give information. But most of the information you're given is based on argument, okay? But, but sometimes filtered through persuasion. Maybe that's the best way to think about the distinction between the two. Someone is giving you an argument, uh, advertise, uh, that, that's exactly where I'm going with my notes, advertising. On the one hand, they're arguing something, but they're actually persuading as well. So that, that, that goes back to what I was saying about, what, 15 minutes ago, okay? Again, though, I think you, you get what I'm talking about. And so once you start to learn the, the process of logic, the process of argumentation, you start to then see cracks in the arguments that others are giving you, right? There, it's, it's funny. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. The word rhetorical, rhetoric. Well, the word rhetorical as we know it today, actually, um, we think of it as one, like monologic is the term I would use, but what one-way dialogue, Okay. In other words, if I ask you a rhetorical question, I don't want an answer. However, if we go back to the root of the word, uh, going back to the Greeks, uh, rhetoric meant understanding both sides of every issue. So if you were a rhetorician, you could argue regardless, like regardless of what, of what your, the opposition was arguing, you could take the other side. That was the art of rhetoric. We've kind of, we've kind of lost that along the way, right? I mean, well, we've lost a lot of, of, of the intended meanings of things uh, from the Romans and the Greeks, right? In, in Western civilization. And so if you think about, yeah, think about advertising. Advertising, my goodness, you are, stuff is thrown at all of us every day. Much of it false, right? Much of it with fine print. 
I, I always think of, uh, um, especially if you're watching uh, American TV, where um, they'll advertise some new drug, right? And then at the end of the commercial, may, 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 side effects may include, and then they go on for like 15 minutes telling you what all the side effects are, right? Like, and there was one, there was actually one on TV at the very end, or death. <laughs> oh, okay, well, then maybe it'll avoid that one. Or maybe it'll work. Hmm, I don't know. I'll have to decide there. Anyway, I think you see what I'm getting at, okay? <laughs> Advertising. I'll give you a perfect example. I haven't seen these lately, um, but uh, Michelin Tires. Michelin Tires, uh, their commercials were famous for having um, a baby at the end of their commercials, and the baby is just sitting in front of a set of tires. And they don't comment on it at all. But what what's the hidden message there? Well, if you have children and if you care about children uh, or your children, then you'll buy our product, right? I mean, you, I, I'm sure you guys are all aware of this. Subliminal advertising, which, yes, on the one hand, has, has been... Like, it, 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 basically, it's been legislated where you're not supposed to do subliminal advertising anymore. But, my God, when you get to social media... Uh, <laughs> that's that's the wild west, right? Um, especially when when next time uh, uh, when 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 there was a uh, I'm, I'm just trying to think of an example here. I've got one, but I I don't want to say it. But I, but next time there's an election, oh God, social media the way that they can just give subliminal messaging or or lying, straight faced lying. Um, a good example um, was uh, Hillary Clinton. And her involvement, her, oh God, her email, whatever. And that was all lies. It, that was all totally fabricated. But you know, I, don't, I don't know if you're aware of this, but there's like 2% of the population in the United States that actually decides every election, right? It usually comes down to 5149. <laughs> so anyway, I know, I know the electoral co college and all of that. But anyway, okay, okay. Oh, okay. So here's a perfect example. Perfect example. And this quote was written by a Canadian, okay, David Frum. So, former President George W. Bush once stated, Saddam Hussein, okay, Saddam, I should say, Saddam Hussein, had weapons of mass destruction, and that the 9-11 attacks, okay, that happened in 2001, were connected to Iraq. Well, in fact, this was... In, do you remember when we were talking about cause, effect, and how some things can be triggered by a variety of events? All of that is a bold-faced lie. It is a lie. And, and a great deal has been documented on that. But it was impressive. It's big. It's scary. And therefore, it, basically, it convinced a hell of a lot of people. So they went to war, right? So... Um, you may be, some of you may be a bit too young to remember that, but I'm sure some of you watching this now know exactly what I'm talking about. And so that, that's my whole point. When you begin to see the, the faults, the gaps in logic, then you become much better at argumentation, right? So rather than simply giving your opinions about things, you've thought about them, you've looked at things, you've researched them. I mean, we've all done it, right? We all, and, and today, to this day, I should say, I still have, I'm sure, I'm sure, I, I have opinions about things I, I, have, I have no idea about, right? Like, like we, we're human beings. But that's my point, though, is to sometimes look beyond what's being told and, and see whether or not these, these ideas are valid. Okay? All right. Anyway. And so that's why at the very bottom of page three I have, some people can be persuaded by being told lies and playing on fears. All right, and boy, I I could go on for two for two days about that. But anyway, the money that was made off of the the Iraq War is unbelievable, unbelievable. And if you and if you don't believe me, look up the name Dick Cheney and a company called Halliburton. That's all I need to say. There are others as well. And so, if you if you try to get away with something like that, remember you're not you're not writing your papers for you know like the news like on CNN or Fox or whatever, right? Instead, you are writing for professors, and professors supposedly are experts in their field. I'm not okay. I only play one on TV, but 
but for your professors, they're experts. They'll know, like, like they, they will see faulty logic immediately. Okay, so be that's all I'm trying to say there is be aware of that, all right? Yeah, any person aware of the principles of sound reasoning is not usually swayed by lies, okay? Big or small. Um, I have some jokes coming up about that with Bill Clinton in, I think, the next lecture, okay? So I'm picking on the right and the left, okay? Like, wait, again, don't want to divide the room, right? Apple pie, cherry pie, it's up to you, your choice. Okay, anyway, all right. So, now we're going to get into something that, um, these are almost like little things that I've noticed over the years that you really want to avoid. Things that maybe you've been taught, but, but now, let's be aware of those things. And here's the first one. There are two patterns when it comes to argument, all right? There is the classic, my side, their side, right? Okay, or their side, my side, however you want to say it. Where someone is taught that if you begin with a really controversial position, then you better take the other side into consideration. Okay. Maybe we want to rethink that, okay? You don't want to spend half your paper for, for the paper that you're going to submit for this course and any other papers, right, in your academic career. You don't want to spend half your paper dealing with the other side of the issue. Why would you bother? And so, that pattern, okay, some of you may have been taught, involves the, the pro-con, right? Or the con-pro, or however you, however you want to say it, where basically you, you acknowledge the, the opponent point of view, and then you refute with your point of view. Okay, no, 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 no. But I'm going to show you a trick here in just a second. That may work in speeches, editorials, or what have you, but avoid that in academic papers. Okay, so, so regardless of what you've been taught, don't do that. But, like I said, I'm going to show you a trick. If you've been taught that, I'm, I'm looking quickly at the lectures now. If you've been taught that, then almost inevitably, what happens is you end up falling into the comparative analysis or comparative contrast type of writing, which we'll talk about in Lecture 11, and you don't have to watch. You'll see. The first thing I say in Lecture 11 is, you don't need this unless someone actually asks you to do it. In Lecture 11, I will go into comparative analysis, contra comparison and contrast. It is a horrible form of writing. It really is. And it's not very effective. Usually does not create arguments. Okay? Like, it, it simply doesn't generate arguments. So I actually say at the very beginning of Lecture 11, you don't have to watch this. You don't have to watch this for this course. However, okay, I should say for this course, period. However, comma, um, you may be asked to do something like that down the road. So I go into an entire lecture on, okay, think about these things. If you are asked to do that, then think about these things as well. So let me repeat and do not email me. <laughs> for this course, you do not have to watch lecture 11. Okay, all right. Shall I say that one more time? <laughs> For this course, you do not have to watch Lecture 11. But hang on to it. Hang on to it because because I do have some pretty good insights into how to avoid some of the pitfalls that, that go into writing uh, a, what, is, what is known as a comparative analysis. Okay? All right. Anyway. I just... Professor, I just wanted to email you and clarify. Are, were you being serious where you said you didn't have to watch Lecture 11? Yes! <laughs> okay. We'll talk about, we'll goof around about that in workshop, all right? Okay, so, okay, but what if you do have a controversial, like, like, what if you are writing a controversial, when I say controversial, I say, by the way, remember, I don't mean controversial topics, I mean some, an intelligent person should be able to disagree with whatever you're writing, okay? But I don't mean the topic itself, like abortion. Don't write stuff like that for this, for this course, okay? Don't do that. But an intelligent person should be able to disagree with your argument. Okay. Well, then, let's say, let's just say that all of a sudden you make a statement and you think, hmm, I, I can't really just get away with saying that because I know. So, okay, fine, fine. So, as you make the statement, why not start with a very simple word that I introduced to you in Lecture 4 or, I, no, Lecture 2 
or three, when we were talking about grammar, why not start a sentence when, when you know you need to acknowledge the other side, which you may have to do every once in a while. Well, don't spend half your paper on it. How about starting a sentence with the word although? Or while. While some have argued, I'm going to give you an example here in just a moment. There it is right there. See, let, like I said, I know the notes. So while deregulation has benefited many large corporations, it has actually endangered the public good. So I don't need to spend half, I'll, I'll come back to that sentence in just a moment. I don't need to spend half my essay on, on that idea, but I can acknowledge it. Yes, sure, sure. I know that there, there is another side to this issue, right? So within a sentence, you can take care of that by acknowledging it. Now, as we get more sophisticated, there are, are other ways that we can do that. We can do that like through footnotes and things like that. But let's not worry about that for a first year course, okay? That's where we get way more sophisticated in, in upper level uh, essays, all right? Okay. Um, but yeah, so, so my point being, if you, if you take a look at the way I wrote that, well, if you, d depending upon your political bent, left or right, um, yeah, you, you could write it the other way. You could flip that. Like, obviously, I'm, I'm writing this from a bit of a leftist point of view, right? Like, uh, like, in other words, I'm against deregulation. I think regulation is important. Okay, but what if you don't? Well, then, you could have flipped that to acknowledge, well, while regulation may have some benefits or what have you to, the, to society, the costs outweigh those, but, right? You see what I mean? Like, like, depending upon your position. And that goes back to what I was arguing earlier about, do I have to agree with your initial position to begin with on your paper? No, but, but are you making a, a credible argument? right so now i think now those ideas are starting to become clearer right yes and so as i said in the final paper if you need to if, if you feel the need to include proofs that work against your side fine but 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 just do it like within a sentence acknowledge and move on right yeah work them in and then argue against it in the same paragraph okay so that's my whole point is going back to the pro con structure don't do that don't spend half your essay dealing with the other side. As a matter of fact, I don't know. I think I did. Um, if you remember, in uh, when I was talking about the thesis, I think I might have started talking about titles as well. And um, my favorite one was "They're uh, They're After Me, Lucky Charms." Okay, I, I think I mentioned that. Maybe not. But one of my favorite titles of a paper was "They're After Me, Lucky Charms." And uh, of course, like, so <laughs> what the hell does that mean? Like, like that doesn't really reflect whatever the argument is going to be. Your thesis should reflect your argument. But I, but I did laugh. I, I thought that was funny. My point being, sorry, I just want to look at one other thing. I don't want to mix up here. Yeah. Okay. So my, my point being that if you're, if you, if you are acknowledging the other side, you don't want to spend half your paper. And so that same paper, they're after me, lucky charms. The student ended up doing that, where it, it, like basically their side, my side, their side, my, and the argument for their side was way more convincing than my side. So you don't want to do that, okay? I don't know. I don't know how more how more logical I can be when it comes to okay. Avoid that. All right. Okay. Anyway. Okay. So um, the structural pattern. Then I don't even know if I need to include this here, but but uh, again, I want to be as clear as I can. The Structural pattern for argumentative uh, arguments, sorry, for academic arguments, not argumentative arguments. That was a bit redundant, but anyway, um, we'll use, use the familiar thesis statement. So we're not doing the scientific uh, method. Instead, after you do your research, you come up with your thesis, it'll be in your first paragraph, and you work the argument through. And then chances are the thesis will kind of emerge in, 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 in a different way in your conclusion, right? right? As we talked about, as we talked about before. And so, basically, yeah. So the first step then will be to do some research. Discover, examine, okay? And after you've discovered and examined research, then you state an opinion about that, okay? And so the, the logic of your opinion, okay, must be carefully scrutinized before the opinion can serve as a subject of, 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 of a, a persuasive piece of writing. Okay, but really, I'm talking about argument there. And so, how many times do I have to say this? The crucial test for a satisfactory statement of opinion, meaning thesis, right, is that someone could argue the contrary point of view, which is fine. That's exactly how academic writing works. If 
if one person had all the answers to everything, right? Well, then there wouldn't really be any need for argumentation, would there? So, and so in other words, it just, that's not the way these things work. So, okay, so to finish off page four, once you've ensured that your reasons are accurate, relevant and complete, the next step is to arrange these things, okay, in some kind of order. And if you remember, now that you have had feedback on your outline, okay, that should all fall into place, you would think. And if I saw maybe there was a problem with the with the way in which you laid it out, I might have put an arrow to say, how about we do this first? Or in, in other words, like, I'll help you with that. But eventually you'll have to figure that out on your own. So you'll, you'll have to figure out, well, what is the best way to put this together? All right. And then finally, um, the last step really for your argument would be to link all of the, the, the reasons in a grammatically parallel thesis statement. Okay. And I've got an example of what I mean by that right here. Okay. So there's a couple of ways you could, you could actually put a thesis statement together. And I, I, I mentioned this a long time ago, but I figure may as well repeat that now. All right. So here's a couple, a couple of different ways to do it. Censorship of books is dangerous because, and the word because is quite often, if, if you have trouble with thesis statements, the word because can help. It, it actually, it's an active verb and it can actually push meaning along. All right. So, censorship of books is dangerous because it restricts the individual's right to read, impedes artists' ability to create, and jeopardizes society's freedom of expression. So notice the way I did that there. Now, I believe in the next lecture, I'm going to talk more about parallelism. Like, we have lots of time before you have to submit your final paper, right? So, I'm going to talk more about that word parallel, all right? You, you'll see what I mean, okay? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's in, it's in either lecture 9 or 10, but it'll be weeks before your paper is due okay but that would be an example of parallel all right where, where i'm basically being consistent with the way i'm expressing my sections okay okay maybe, maybe i should give you a quick example right now but i but I, i'll give you this example again right when it comes to lecture nine or ten um the woman was was confident um oh gosh let me just think for a moment off the top of my head the woman was confident successful and knew how to dress that would be an example of faulty parallelism where i'm not being consistent with the way i express that so instead i could have said geez i can't even remember the examples now again the woman was confident successful and fashionable no notice the difference in the way in which i express that and i can do that a thousand different ways as long as i'm consistent it again it just gives a better flow to your writing right and so I could have done, but I could have done the thesis a bit differently. So, because of the aforementioned reasons, meaning my sections of argument, may, maybe, maybe I like to include the sections of argument in my thesis. Okay, you can blend them, like like we each have our own styles. Or I could have done it this way because of the aforementioned reasons. So, so now I'm going to have the thesis on its own. These are only examples, by the way, uh, like s literally just examples, thousand for ways you could do this. For the above forementioned reasons, censorship of books should not be allowed based on the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So you see, see, see the different way I did that there? It's the same idea, but I'm simply expressing it a bit differently. And like I said, we have we each have all our own styles or what have you, okay? All right. Now, um, so so in a sense, argument is not easy. Like if you if you give individuals information okay well that's pretty straightforward but to actually try and convince someone that's not easy so what do you do you have to then do a bit of work you you obviously you have to go do a bit of research right only makes sense so that then you have the facts remember what i said earlier about getting the facts straight knowing that you can basically support the opinion you are putting forth then don't make it sound like an opinion by not using the first person pronoun. You simply state the case and back it up. That's how a really good argument works, okay? All right, and so that's why I say, bring someone over to, the, to your side. And, and again, you don't have to bring someone over, but I think you understand what I mean. Making, being convincing, being convincing, okay? Uh, and, and so, yes, yes, uh, it, it's not an easy process. It's not an easy process. But with a bit of work, and if you just follow the guidelines I gave you here, yeah, I, I, 
you'll obviously start to get better at it. Okay. And again, a lot of it will start, a lot of it will start with, once you've done a bit of research, a lot of it will start with a topic. Do you have a topic that allows you to create a really good argument? Right? And so that's why I suggested maybe avoid the course outline. Come up with something on your own. All right? Okay. Now, the next thing we're going to do, this is only going to take maybe 10, 15 minutes, but the next thing we're going to do, I'm going to talk to you a bit about the Oh boy, uh, uh, the, the annotated bi bibliography and your final term, okay? Your final term paper. In, this is the information you will need for all that stuff. Now, when I say an annotated, annotated bibliography, I want to be clear. I'm not going to ask you really to do a complete annotated bibliography. The instructions for the bibliography, they're included in this module, Lecture 8, you will see in lecture eight, it says instructions for, or no, actually it might say something like, uh, oh gosh, I, I just put it on before I started the lecture, but but it, it'll say something like um, sample pages, examples, whatever works cited references, okay? It's something like that. Well, there's only one file there, so obviously you'll know which one it is. Okay, so, and then I've also included it in a separate file in the course content. So if you remember when you first go to the course content and you go to uh, course files, remember there's about five or six things in there. Well, it's in there as well. So it, no problem. It, it's, it's, it's everywhere. <laughs> there was a cartoon character, something, savoir faire is everywhere. Okay, anyway. Um, all right, so, so all those things are included at Brightspace. So now... I'm not going to go, there's no way I can explain everything that I have here in front of, of, of you with your notes. I'm giving you the source material you will need to put together either a proper works site. Make, make a note right now because this is not clear in, in the notes. I didn't want to, I didn't want to like get too much information in this lecture because then I thought, oh man, this is going to sound confusing. So very simple what I'm doing here. All right. I'm going to show you, I've, I've broken up MLA. How do you do a works cited? If you're doing a works cited, you are using MLA style, Modern Language Association. If you are using APA style, okay, that's American Psychological Association. You're going to be, well, by now, you, you know which one you've done. After your summary, after your midterm, you know which one you're using. So now we have to figure out that final page, a separate page, after the essay that you will submit, okay? Like after you finish your essay, then you have a new page and the new page will either have the heading works cited or it will have references. So let's take a look here. Both forms, so it doesn't matter which one you're using, they require double space, okay? Just like the rest of your paper. They should begin on a new page Okay, so this is the only, I think this is the only time I've asked you to do this, but, but now you need to know how to do it. So they should begin on a separate page. And then the font should be Times New Roman. So don't change anything. All right. And then do not cut and paste from other sources for your either works cited or references page. So again, works cited, MLA, references, that's APA. Okay. So like I said, I'm going to be a bit general here, just pointing out a whole lot of things. So I've shown you, okay, for MLA, you would center your title, but do not bold. Do not bold the phrase works cited. Okay. So you start center works cited. Then you have your, your annotations. Okay. Just exactly the way it looks there. And I've given you, oh man, I've given you so many examples. So these are the kind of things I'm not going to, I'm not going to talk about in workshop or whatever. Like it's all there for you. And, and it, it's not like I created all this. I simply found all this on OWL. Remember the OWL hoo -hoo at, at Purdue? Okay. It's all there. You can find all this stuff so easily. But I do want to point out a couple of things. Let's look at the second example. The, well, the example on page six, where it says a work in an anthology reference or collection. All I want to show you here is when you start, and, and, and by, like, like, again, it's very generic, last name, first name, 
title of essay, all of that title collection, which is italicized. Like follow, follow exactly, depending upon which one you need. Because I'm, sh I'm showing you a book, uh, an anthology, an online journal. Like I've given you all the different examples. All right, you've got everything you need there. But notice in the citations, and this is true for MLA and APA, notice you start on the left-hand side, okay? But then when you get to the second line, the second line is tabbed. It's indented, okay? So make sure it looks like that in your final page, all right? So we start at the left-hand side, but then when we get to the next line, if need be, like if necessary, then you indent the second line. And if you need a third line, that's indented as well. Oh, oh that's why I have the example there, okay? So a couple of things we could talk about there, and again, I don't want to confuse you, but when you start to get into articles and things like that, then you not only would have the, the information, but if you take a look there where I say a work in an anthology reference or collection, all the stuff there is pretty straightforward. But the one thing that may not be clear is page range. What does that term actually mean? And that simply means if I was quoting something, if I were quoting something, I should say the subjunctive, if I were quoting something from an actual journal, um, well, in that journal, there, there, there may be, like one journal may have, you know, 25 different articles. So the page range simply means, well, if I'm quoting from this one thing in, in a collection, uh, whatever, then you'll find it between pages. I, I think I've got the example there. You'll find it there between 24 and 34. Okay. That, that's all page range means. All right. Okay. And then, um, if you look, there's an, another thing. Most of you, I think most of you will know this stuff, but nowadays we have these things called DOIs. And I'll say a bit more of that in just a second, but it's a digital object identifier. Okay. Eh, don't worry about it. It's like your, it's like your pin, right? Your personal identification number. <laughs> and no one knows what the hell pin stands for. Right. But anyway, that's what it means. So this, this gives you an example of how, how arbitrary some of this stuff is. Notice at the very bottom there, before I get into the APA, MLA now encourages the inclusion of a DOA, uh, sorry, a DOI, if, uh, if one is available. That's the best I can give you. <laughs> That's straight out of the MLA guide, okay? So if a DOI is available, add it. And so that's why I've given you the example there under um, Smith and then Janus. All right? So that's how you would do an online journal in NMLA. All right. And, and again, like you have to do a bit of work when it comes to this course. So so just familiarize yourself with these things. OK. Or go to Al. Uh, like it's all it's all there for you. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't be surprised if I might have one one little mistake in here somewhere because these things are changing all the time, all the time. Right. But anyway. OK. So there you go. OK. So now. Let's look at APA. And again, I'm not an expert in APA. I mean, because I use MLA with all the stuff that I do, right? But in APA, now you would actually bold and center the word references, okay? And I believe that's new. I do believe that that is a relatively new thing. I believe now the style guide that's out now for APA, okay, I don't want to say the number because then I'll never be able to use this lecture again. But the most recent, I believe the most recent, um, it, it now says you bold the actual title and it's centered. So that's why I have it there. Right? We're at the bottom of page six. Okay? So the word references now is bolded and in the middle. But that's the only thing that is bolded. All right? Okay? It goes back to, for those of you doing APA, if you remember on your title page, uh, it, it, I didn't talk about this, but in the sample uh as a sample, uh, sample example, <laughs> conjunction, junction, but in the sample example, um, it, you can see that your title should be bolded on your title page. So when you're, when you're submitting your final, right, when you're submitting your final term paper, your title page, the title should be bolded. And that's the only thing that is bolded, except for then when we finally come to the page references and the word references is bolded. All right. So then what I've included is a generic, I mean, really generic uh, example. And um, 
Yeah, I'm just looking here. Oh, I don't know why there the the H T T P S D O I is underlined there. Okay, that shouldn't be underlined. But again, it's because of the way I took it off of uh, off of. Um, Sorry, the way I took it off of the OWL website, I believe that's why the underline in, it came up. But you don't, you, you do not underline that. Okay, so basically, like I said, I could spend an hour going through each individual, but why bother, right? You can look up whatever you need. I've given you a generic example, then I've given you an article in a print journal, and then an, uh, an article in an electronic journal. And so AP, APA 7, right, that's the, the one that I was using. It advises readers to include a DOI if available, even if you're using the print source. So I guess all I'm saying is, if you're including a print source or not, like, oh, sorry, if you're including an electronic or a print source, if the DOI is there, then include. All right? But again, like, like I, I don't have this information in my head. I don't walk around with this information in my head. So if you have questions about that, go to OWL. And that, and, and that is the best site to go to, right? Because remember, you'll be doing, you, your, your essays will not be for English down the road unless you're an English major. Instead, you'll be using it for other disciplines. Well, the, the OWL is the one to go to because that's what everyone uses. And so, last thing then. Uh, okay, I guess I got ahead of myself here. Um, but a DOI may not be available. Like I said, okay, I'm repeating myself now because I got I jumped ahead a bit. All right, okay, that 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 I think I think we're almost done for the day. So, at the end of each citation or what have you, then um, each one of them will end with a period. Okay, now, now I haven't really I haven't really talked about the annotated bibliography specifically for our purposes. That's because. I created a, a, a whole different file, and that is now on the, the lecture eight as well, okay? So all the information you need, don't, again, don't email me about this, it's all there. I've, I've made sure that you, but, but we'll talk about, we'll talk about that, I'm sure, in the workshops, but it's all there for you. It's all there, okay? So, um, yeah, where, where we have the, the one assignment, that says introduction slash bibliographies or whatever. I actually have a file right there in the module and explains everything you need. But we, but again, we will talk about that in, in, in the workshops. Alrighty. So I think, I think that's everything we needed for today. Um, yeah. So the next time we, we get together, we'll be looking at a bit of usage and i um, just looking here at uh, where we're headed. Yeah. We'll be looking at a bit of uh, usage style, things like that. All right. Okay, so I didn't have too many jokes today. Sorry about that. But um, yeah, we're done. Okay, we'll see you next time. Okay, bye-bye.